with the digital education. Uh, he has over 10 years professional experience in need learning and education and has led, created, supported, consulted, managed, and developed variously e-learning strategies and initiatives during uh, uh, his uh, professional career. James, you, you have the floor. Oh. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's, it's actually now nearly 15 years in, in digital education, which is a bit shocking, actually. But um, I'm here anyway to uh, touch similar on what other presenters have said in the last round around um, online uh, education. Um, but the, the word in fashion at the moment it, it seems to be in, in our institution is around innovation. Um, innovation is the key word that gets uh, banded around quite a bit. Uh, and I felt that it was useful just to focus in on it to, to make sure that um, we understand what we mean by innovation and also the context of innovation in, in education generally uh, as well as in H, uh, higher education, HE. So my presentation uh, will uh, quickly go through these four, uh, three points. Uh, I've restricted it down now and I've only got 12 minutes, 12, 15 minutes. We'll see how we get on. Uh, hopefully I won't uh, t talk too much. Um, but I have been known to do that. So the first part of the conversation will, uh, or the um, presentation will be around uh, education and innovation concepts. Uh, then I'll give a bit of context around uh, digital education at King's and also look at innovation uh, for, through different lenses. So this, when I say lenses, it's really about three different people's perspectives. And then obviously there's questions, that, uh, opportunities at the end. So education up first. And looking forward, I thought it's always useful to look back um, so, I've got, um, I think, two or three pictures um, that are, are, are from uh, the early, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, and they're images of what, uh, in those days, they were thinking around innovation. So, uh, can anyone guess, or any ideas about this, what could this be in, in modern day, in a modern day uh, world? I haven't got one of these, I wouldn't mind one of these. But yeah, I don't think these are actually existing yet, but um, more around um, the, the automatic hoovers you have and also uh, lawnmowers that have appeared. Um, so back 100 years ago, they were, they were uh, uh, thinking about this. And so the next one. Any ideas? Any thoughts what this could be? Yeah, or even, so you see there's an image as well, a video, Skype for Business, video conferencing nowadays. Again, 100 years ago, this is what they were thinking about. And uh, there's, a, there's a number of these pictures that are not relevant, so I don't think they were on to looking at, uh, had a crystal ball for the future. But it's interesting that some of their, their ideas have come true, even though uh, 100 years later. And this one was uh, particularly ref, uh, relevant to education. Um, and as you see, there's a professor there, on the left, uh, and he's uh, churning up books into a machine that's automatically being fed into the students' heads. So I don't think we're there yet, uh, and I don't. And I think this is this is part of what the, of, of my presentation is about. It's about what do we think education is, and I, I, and um, yeah, I, the, you, there is potential possibilities for this happening today. Um, but I think uh, much more broadly. You might have seen it maybe in, in a film like The Matrix where they download knowledge and that's what the person knows uh, and then they just move on to the next subject. So at King's, um, I think we, when we look back around innovation, we also need, or look forward uh, regarding innovation, we also need to understand the context within the students' expectations. Uh, and, and within King's, obviously, we, we're... Um, there's been a number of changes, uh, especially to the cost of education in HE. Um, this just gives a, a very quick breakdown of what that was. Um, so it goes back 20-odd years ago, where students have started uh, contributing to their tuition fees, uh, up until the modern day, um, where there's been a bit of a rain back in regarding a recommendation about how much students should pay uh, for education. Alongside that... Obviously, there is uh, information is becoming key. Um, so when students look at, uh, at different providers, uh, different degrees, different universities, um, there's a, a wealth of information now available that they can use to compare um, institutions uh, and then obviously make a decision on, on where they prefer to go. There's, other, there's also feedback mechanisms that they use around NSS, uh, NSS uh, surveys for final year students and also 
um, uh, undergraduate final year students as well as uh, postgraduate students, which is the PTES. Uh, and most recently, um, teaching excellence framework. So um, this is again another method or, or example where uh, the, the government is trying to standardize the feedback for students to make choices. Again, so this is all sort of building a picture about what we want to do in regards to innovation. So uh, back a while ago, three and a half years ago, I was asked to put together a digital education strategy for Kings. Um, there's also a separate stream we were looking at, which was around online education. So Kings Online um, was, um, was formed. Um, Kings Online previously um, was called the Central Unit for Distance Learning, Cuddle. They changed it. For, I quite like the name. It used to be known as Cuddle, but they changed it to Kings Online because I think it added a, a bit more substance to what the, the brand of what they're trying to do. On the other side of it, um, I also had to look after what, um, or, look, or, look to, or think about the students that were coming to campus and understand how there's that, that new expectations of what they want from an education at King's. I was told around innovation, and we need to look at innovation, but innovation is very different depending on, on your perspective. Uh, in an institution, um, I could be told that we're looking at new ways of doing admin processes, and that's innovation. Uh, but I could also be asked to look at how we're going to change the curriculum. And again, that's innovation. So what we, I've tried to do is trying to, to, to categorize or categorise from the literature um, innovation definitions, so we can broadly understand where we're going uh, as an institution, or as an institution uh, more generally, and that we're all talking the same language. So I, there's three different aspects we looked at in regards to innovation. There's the efficiency innovations. So this is where we're reducing costs by eliminating resource time or redesigning products processes to eliminate eliminate components or replace them with cheap alternatives. That's a bit of a mouthful. But uh, in a short, uh, a short explanation is just trying to deliver more with less. Now, you could be, um, early on, you could be, that could be seen as online education. There was a, a suggestion that you could um, produce a course, deliver it um, to 50,000 students and use a couple of, of tutors, and that way you're creating efficiencies. I think we all know that's not the case, and, and even so that the, there's an equi uh, equivalent amount of support and, and, and needs for online students as there is campus-based students. So I think that it was good to understand this around efficiency innovations and understanding the, the objectives of, of an institution to make sure that that's put into perspective. There's a the next type, which is sustaining innovation. So um, this is looking at uh, what we're currently doing and trying to improve it. So you always see this with, with products that are out on the market. Um, the example I give in regards to King's is lecture capture. We introduced lecture capture um, four years ago. And again, it's not changing necessarily the pedagogy in the classroom. It's trying to enhance it in some respects. It could be suggested that it's not enhancing it because it's meaning that there's less student participation. But overall, this is the sort of area that we felt that um, lecture capture innovation or the lecture capture um, realm was focused. But there's a wider discussion around that that I'll come on to in, 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 shortly. And then there's the next one, which is uh, disruptive innovation. So this is where we really sort of rip up the rule book, look at different ways of de delivering curricula, uh, and uh, earlier mentioned also looking at different ways for assessment. And I think this is where we really understand what does a student want when they come to university? What are they seeking? Um, and I think depending on discipline, depending on level, uh, depending on uh, a number of factors for that individual will mean different reasons why they go to university. I can only speak for myself, but I know now when I go or study, it's for a very different reason than when I did my under, undergraduate degree. And I, think there's a, and I think it's just understanding the context of that rather than just purely around learning. It's also around interacting with peers. It's also being in a, it, potentially being in a physical space as well uh, and, and having um, access to different types of people as well as coming together as different cultures. Uh, and I think that can't be forgotten about when looking forward, we also need to understand what's gone on in the past, as well as enhance that. So taking that into consideration when we are looking to branch out in, in our online uh, delivery um, options. Now, I, I didn't want to say this was all my, uh, this is by no means my work, but a, a very useful um, article was um, done by one of my colleagues at, at Keynes, Michael Flavin. So there is a, a link to it. It looks at um, university, uh, UK university strategies for TEL, Technology Enhanced Learning. It's a useful reading, understanding these different types of innovation. So um, please do go and have a look at that. It can be useful for um, useful context. 
So digital education in the context of kings. So we have a vision, uh, a vision, uh, King's uh, strategy vision of 2029. Uh, any ideas why it's 2029? Seems like a bit of an odd number considering everyone's usually on, on, on zeros or fives. Rawad, you can't answer because obviously you know because you're at King's. <laughs> That's right, uh, two year, 200 years anniversary of King's. So they went long, um, this has been around now for since 2017, but um, the key part of this was um, looking at um, understanding why students come to King's and maybe don't go to one of the other Russell uh, Group universities. And a key part of this um, is obviously putting research and education at the same level, um, especially with the new expectations uh, coming from students. Uh, but then also um, to serve. So there's a serve aspect to the curriculum that is been trying to be uh, is in the, at the moment being implemented across the King. So uh, service to society, be it local or across the world, that's part of what we want students that come to Kings to, to be able to understand and deliver. So there's the standard uh, education strategy themes that came out of. Um, Oh, oh, sorry, there's uh, off the back of the vision was the education strategy, um, which was over five years, so 2022. 20, and it's the standard aspects that you would expect from, from most uh, uh, strategies or education strategies. It's about obviously delivering world class um, education as research um, informed. Um, there's a piece around it flexing the curricula. So it's looking at also uh, for students not to just be pigeonholed in one discipline, to be able to move around, have the opportunities to sample different, different modules from different areas. That is something that is definitely applicable to the online um, uh, realm as well. There's that civil engagement, which I mentioned before, uh, and also making sure that King's students are equipped for success. So this again goes to one of my earlier points about making sure or understanding why students are going to university. It's not necessarily just like the picture from, from earlier on says, it's just putting knowledge in their heads and then going out. It's much more practical than that. It's about interacting with people. It's about understanding how to use different tools, how to become employable in some respects. Um, there's also an agenda around well-being, and I think that's a key piece we need to understand with looking at online education, uh, understanding if people are um, isolated and don't feel community or don't feel part of an institution. That, that we need methods of, um, um, and opportunities to, to integrate that as well. And also to make sure that uh, a lot of what we do at King's is student, uh, is we see students as co-collaborators. So the past to here and now, um, this, this just gives you a bit about what I already mentioned. About four years ago, we, had a, we were developing our virtual learning environment, which is similar to other institutions, uh, which is Moodle. Um, uh, we had our lecture capture implementation, and this was a key piece as well, because it, it, we needed to understand or try to understand why we were installing lecture capture. Um, students wanted it, um, so it, was, uh, it seemed like everyone else was doing it. Um, but the research has come back most recently about potentially how um, lecture capture could be um, impacting students' final grades because um, it's maybe impacting attendance. Uh, and then there's much wider uh, issues with that as well about what is the lecture meant to be, um, be delivering. Um, there was, you could say that um, high scoring students, um, if they're not attending lectures, then that's fine. They're just watching lecture capture and getting the information through there and then doing their, their exams, that's fine. But I think that's missing a piece of the puzzle is that peer interaction and learning from your peers that could go missing. So there's a piece of work we're looking at the moment about reimagining the lecture at King's and understanding what students want from lectures. So we've did, um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ellie Domet um, has recently done a piece of research around uh, lecture capture evaluation at King's over a year to understand student and staff's perspectives of it, of it to then in, in, inform what we want to do going forward. But again, it goes back to that key piece I keep going on about, is about what we are trying to support students and, and what they're trying to do. Um, those other pieces I've already mentioned about also linking into why we needed to invest some money in this space to understand where we're going with technology and how it can support the curriculum. So we've done uh, a number of things over the last three years. One of uh, the big things we released was lynda.com. Lynda I'm not sure if anyone in this room has heard of lynda.com. Um, it's now um, LinkedIn or moving to LinkedIn Learning, but it's a wealth of content that's available to all our students um, to 
to push their digital uh, capabilities up. Um, there's um, content in there around how to use um, all sorts of products, uh, Microsoft products, uh, also through to um, time management, um, well-being, how to play jazz, guitar. But I think in, in the context of looking at um, understanding the sport of students, it's a, a, well, a, a well worth um, um, uh, initiative that we, we took part in. Um, we've done lots of other things. That I, I, I won't go through the list because I appreciate the time. But we've been doing lots of things around looking at our policies, um, how we um, deliver our virtual classrooms, um, delivering consistent content through templates, um, repositioning our CPD offering, supporting our academics with a new education strategy, um, as well as um, looking at our... Uh, where we've done a benchmarking exercise, but then also looking at blended learning. And again, a bit like innovation, blended learning is a term that's, that's mentioned quite a bit of the time. Uh, it was in our education strategy, and, but then I think when we went into a room of 20 academics, everyone was doing blended learning, but, no one, but everyone was doing different types of blended learning. So again, it's clarifying. If, you put something, if we're putting something in our strategy, we need to clarify what that is and give people the measures to be able to, be able to succeed in that. And I think that's where the online and in-class uh, um, world come together. In, there needs to be a bit of, um, for our students that are campus-based, obviously we want to give them flexibility uh, with engaging with content and, and using the contact hours, um, the, making them the most valuable. But then we know there's a, there's a wider issue with that. In, if we were reducing hours, it's seen as not getting value for money. So there's a balance to have there around um, providing technology, sub, not necessarily substitutes, equivalents, and then seeing how that culturally impacts students and what they think uh, the offer the education offer is, is, is given to them. Um, so the future uh, is really, uh, again, is aligned to why do students want to study? And it's looking at how you can then facilitate that. So we have Kings Online, as I mentioned, uh, looking to provide education for students all around the world. Um, we also have Future Learn. We, ha we have MOOCs on Future Learn as well. But we have a plethora of different options that we're, we're obviously learning from, from, from engaging in and constantly evolving to see how it marries up with our, with our physical um, students, that are, uh, our physical campus and our students that are attending as well. Um, and I think it's best uh, understanding how we best use those resources going forward. But is the future, I suppose it's the question, is it disruptive or not? And I think this is where one of the questions um, really needs to be realised because uh, King's is quite a um, traditional institution, 200 years. Um, um, we need, there needs to be a round of change management, understanding how people engage in these different types of technology to support education. There's a big effort and time used around curriculum design. I don't think you can bolt on education or technology onto the end of, of a curriculum. It really needs to be thought about from the very beginning. Um, there's also recognition for, for engaging in this work. Uh, blended learning is a, a big thing that we need to come to some sort of agreement or understanding what we mean by blended learning so then we can work towards it. Assessment was, was mentioned earlier on. We need to understand the different types of assessment um, that need to be employed and why we assess students uh, and the options there as well. Analytics is a big thing as well. Data, the amount of data that is being produced from, from having all of our technologies and how we best support our students. Um, there's ethics there around all that data, what we do with it when students are, are with us at King's and then how we best process it and make sure that they're supported and achieving the most they can uh, with, their, uh, uh, with their time at King's. Um, there's a big uh, piece around pers personalising the learning for individuals, so understanding what students want and making sure that they have access not only to the learning content but also the wraparound activities for being part of the university, be it social clubs, online, and these, I think that's an issue that we, we've always experienced about building that community. Well, we, we struggle building a community on campus, I guess, uh, but it's, it, there's much bigger challenges when it's online. And then also making sure that our classrooms uh, 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 and online, de online design reflect this new curriculum, uh, especially around accessibility. There's new regulations around accessibility this year. Um, I think there's mention of universal design. There's, there's lots of things that can be done to make sure that our content is accessible for everyone. So that's really just um, a, a couple of considerations um, to have in mind uh, when looking at digital education more generally. Um, as I said, um, you can, if, you, if you did want to find out a bit more around the, the units, uh, centre, we call it CTEL, but Central, uh, C, uh, Centre for Technology Enhanced Learning, we have um, information on our web pages.
Um, and that's it. Thank you, James. Uh, happy 90th anniversary to, to the King's <laughs> College, anyway. Uh, uh, we, we, we are grateful for your such so systematic and comprehensive uh, presentation of all aspects uh, and all, uh, uh, all elements that can uh, be used uh, to, uh, uh, for, for the digital technology to lead us to, to innovation. Uh, it's a very deep presentation. Hopefully, we'll have time to, to digest uh, even more your methodological approach is very very interesting. Thank you very much, James. You, you. I now give the will give the floor to uh, to Alan Dean. Alan Dean is managing director of Burning to Learn. I think while we all recognize the advent of digital uh, technologies upon us, uh, Alan is uh, uh, taking care that uh, we don't lose uh, humanity, and uh, uh, his concern is to allow people to restore the sense of uh, worth. I don't know if he. He uh, heard me, but that is uh, probably uh, the essence of his presentation. You have the floor, Adam. Thank you very much. Oh, let's get this going. Oh, go. Where's my little box there? She is. Right. First of all, folks, what I'd like to say, uh, having trouble with my way. My name is there. I am your official gate crasher. I'm not a professor. I'm out of my depth standing up here in front of you all. But to just say thank you for the opportunity. Burning to Learn was started over 25 years ago. And basically the aim was to link with young people that didn't enjoy education. And the idea was to actually pull them in. And what we actually did was co-created their education. We listened to the school and we spun it around so the youngster felt they were in they controlled the direction. We took away the fear. We all know that's a problem in education, isn't it? If you don't understand it, you get really, really nervous. So they had the ownership. We've taken away the fear. Understanding their values, their culture, that was key to finding out what way they wanted to go. And that then sparked their interest. Basically, we called it education by stealth. They didn't realise the education was getting and they weren't fighting. It was that successful we were asked to move from special needs across to comps, across to grammar school, onto colleges, onto universities. And the interesting thing we found at the coalface was once a young person felt valued, they worked harder. When you went to the top academic level, they questioned. In my humble opinion, I feel some of them lost their vision because they actually stuck to getting a grade. The grade become the key. And they lost their purpose. Once they saw their purpose, it fired them up and away they went. So, if we just move on. My question is, are we willing to change? We're all talking about it, but are we genuinely willing to change? Autonomous vehicles, it knows where it's going, but do we know where we're going? What should education be teaching a 10-year-old? That's my question, because this change is so fast, I'm frightened we're going to miss some things. There's a tsunami of change coming. And we've got to teach young people to ride that tsunami. It's key. As far as I'm concerned, we are in a really difficult place. So if we go forward, do we know what the future is? I don't think we do. So how can we educate someone for something that we don't know? I took off five years ago. I stepped back from working in the classroom and started doing research, talking to educators around the world. Canada, America, Australia, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, Sri Lanka, 
Spain, Denmark, Holland, and listen to the questions that they were coming up with. How do we hook these young people? And for me, when the SDGs came out, that was the answer. I saw the SDGs as where all the jobs are going to come from. If you look at the 17 points and you had an interest, go after that interest because they're the problems that need to be solved. But we've got to find a way of actually making our youngsters feel valued. So there she lies. That's my vision. I want to create a heart, a passion and a drive. And I think the vehicle is e-learning. And I think the power comes from sustainability without a shadow of a doubt. And from that, I look at the donut and circular economy as the first small steps. They're not the answer. The SDGs are not the answer. They're frameworks to use. So we've got to start looking at e-learning as a way that we can actually package and move it. But we need to move it for you, for you. We're all going in different directions, but we need to harness each other's skills in that direction. If I want to go to Geneva, I speak to you, we go to Geneva. You know some very nice restaurants. But we've got to find out where we're going to go. So as I look at it, we've got to look at the SDGs as the base. This is where we're going to travel. This is what it's all about. But we've got to turn to governance is the driver. If they align everything, we will go faster. But if they stay in silo thinking, they will just stagnate because they're frightened of change. We're all frightened of change. That's why we don't do it. Uh, stay awake at the back. So I think we all need individuals, communities, to take this load. It's essential. So moving on on a personal note, I've taken it into education. So I've gone into my district, which is Seven Oaks District, and I'm looking at a town called Swanley. 16,000 people. How can we get the SDGs into their mindset? So I've gone along to the local council. I'm sitting on a neighbourhood plan, which is hopefully going to frame the way that town should go forward. But we have to do it with the people. If you don't bring the people to the table, we can't work this out. So what we've gone along, and anyone heard of Tigron? It's software pattern for modelling. Sim City for real, taking the data and creating your city. Well, I'm trying to do that in the schools where they're actually getting the youngsters designing their town and how it hooks into the global goals. I keep going back to it because I think it's key. Clara, as we've mentioned, integral framework is all there to evaluate where we're going. I've sat here today and I've seen so many little cogs have turned in my head that I think it's a powerful movement but we do need to start talking about where we're going not about the problem we've got to find the answer where it all goes so my last little slide points out talk to me are we willing to change and if not when Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alam. Yes, uh, you, you did what I said that you do, uh, bringing the, the human backs uh, in the use of, uh, of technology and uh, uh, making, uh, helping people to restore their sense of worth. That was a very convincing demonstration. Now, uh, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, uh, over half an hour for uh, questions and answers. So. Uh, uh, please, uh, uh, as we did uh, in the first part, uh, introduce yourself and ask your questions to one or both of the, of the panelists.
Yes, yes, Professor. Okay, um, this is a question for, for James. Um, um, lecture capture, a very interesting subject that I've debated many times with, with colleagues uh, across different universities. Um, one of my kind of bugbears with, with the concept of lecture capture is that if I can replace a lecture with a recording of it, what's the value of that experience in situ? That's a really good point. Um, I think it's uh, that is a, a really uh, good question, and I think it's a case of understanding what the academic is trying to do in that session, and whether or not it's purely didactic uh, um, um, or providing information to the students. I think the lecturing part of a, of a, of a lecture, shall we say, might not necessarily be the whole fifty minutes. And so I think there's the reasons that are there. That I mean, within Kings, we have the option for the academic to pause and uh, and start the recording if they want to, to then engage in that debate and discussion. Um, I think if we if we think that all lectures are like that, then we're probably trying to kid ourselves. And I think there needs um, there needs to be a look at how how we do deliver lectures. Hence that I mentioned around the, us looking at about not um, reimagining the lecture so, that, so students see the value in it. And I think that's, that's a key bit, is that lecture isn't just the recording, it's also, um, or that, that part of information, it's also the, 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 the surrounding debate, the challenges, the questions, the feedback, and what have you. Uh, that said, though, from our lecture capture um, evaluation report, the feedback from some students was they expected to be lectured at which was another, another take on, on, on what people perceived education is. Um, so I understand what you're saying, and we could just record the lectures and not bother having any physical spaces or, or, or chairs. Uh, but then again, that goes back to the cultural or the culture shift in what students are expecting when they go to university. So hopefully we can um, um, not necessarily change lectures in some respects because the whole purpose of them is around, or where they originated from was the efficiency again, around it's a bit similar to a high stakes final assessments. It's the easiest way to... to shared knowledge with a, with a wide audience, um, but also looking at the value of that and, and breaking it up. So maybe you've, um, obviously, I'm assuming, uh, yeah, you would have heard about flipped classrooms, so where the, the, the learning is, is in video format before the session and when they come to the session, there's much more discursive and, and learning from peers, and that might be a, a reasonable method to, to do going forward, but um, I would, we wouldn't recommend that we just provide lecture captures and that's it because I think I think there's a, a technique to delivering online education that isn't just a video for for 55 minutes it's much more nuanced than that in regards to chunking it up understanding interactions and engaging and understanding the content hopefully that answers yeah <laughs> great thank you anybody else I have a question. How do we create that safe space for professors that allows them to push those envelopes? I can't answer that. I've got to ask the professors. How do we actually create that safe space? Okay, um, well, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to add my thoughts and then maybe somebody else uh, can pick up on that too. I think the, the way in which you provide a safe space is actually providing capacity to the academic teams, is understanding who is best at doing what. Uh, when we create a partnership with a university, uh, uh, there is always clarity that the subject matter expertise resides with the academic team. And what we bring into there is the online learning pedagogy expertise. So we add capacity to those teams so that they feel comfortable that what they're really good at is what they're going to carry on doing. And through the engagement with us, they develop their skills and they become more comfortable in doing these things online. Um, so the issue of bringing capacity onto existing academic teams, I think, is the key to, to answering that question. Thank you. Diane, please. Thank you. 
I have two questions for James. Okay, sure. Um, from what I understand, you've done a lot of research on what are the expectations of students, how do they see the future of learning. So first question, so are there any findings that you could share with us that would surprise us that's something that's changing now? And related to that also, from what you were saying, if I didn't misread some of it, um, a lot of the time your um, attempts to assess their needs and expectations turn into treating them as customers, which is different from the traditional relationship between a student and a university. Um, does, did you notice any negative effects of that approach? So two questions for now. Okay. Um, I'll take the customer one first, if that's okay. Um, I think that's a very sensitive um, word uh, to use in academia around treating students as customers. I think that uh, we see him as sort of, especially with our strategy around co-creating. I said maybe I misunderstood. No, 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 no that's fine. No, that's, no, 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 not at all. Um, it can be seen um, because I, I sort of frame it around uh, growing student expectations, around obviously um, expectations from, from the money that, and that is spent in education uh, and what they then perceive um, they get for that, that money. So I would never say students are um, customers, um, merely co-creators or feeding into what experiences they want uh, going forward. Uh, and talking about findings, um, I, think it's, it's, uh, I think we just need to think around students as individuals and understand what they want, for, again, what they want from, from uh, education. Uh, it's also discipline specific. Um, uh, a student that's coming to study law might have a different out, out, uh, um, understanding of what they from, want from that um, degree as opposed to a student that may be doing uh, English literature, for example. Um, but there's all things there about um, growing as individuals and understanding how to work together and also work uh, and engage and question uh, um, each other to then uh, evolve uh, the experience. There's, there's people that will prefer to have a traditional type of teaching, um, which they expect to be in a, a place uh, and a time and be lectured at, as I mentioned. But then there's also students that want flexibility. Uh, want to be able to look at a lecture capture recording, want to be able to choose not to attend, uh, want, depending on different weeks, might want to go to the university, might not want to go to the university. So what we're finding is there's a, a much more uh, variety of, of expectations from the students, and it's trying to cater for those. Any, any general patterns in terms of form and format that, that emerge? Uh, not at the moment. No, sorry. Yes, please. Yeah, my name is Tian from University of East London. My question is directed to James. Um, just want to know, um, introducing this um, e-learning um, and like digital platforms in universities, uh, how does the um, like professors and lecturers uh, see it? Are they um, say willing contributors um, to it because like uh, taking into consideration their jobs as well uh, might be on the line because like uh, the universities might say oh instead of needing five lecturers they might need only two so um, are they willing to contribute or subscribe to that thank you I think it goes back to a bit before about capacity building. Um, at the moment, uh, Cross Kings, the, the, most, the biggest issue is about having time to engage in, in these different activities. It's, and I think um, what the whole purpose of this isn't around um, reducing the headcount of acad academics. It's about enriching the education experience at Kings. Um, so I, I wouldn't see um, seeing digital education as a, a, as some sort of um, in conflict with the number of academics we have at King's. It's purely there as, a, as an enhancement to the experience. Um, having academics engage uh, with using the different tools, we're very conscious, again, around the time that they have available and trying to make things as simple as possible uh, uh, and, and as valuable as possible. Yeah, probably simple is not the right word, as valuable as possible, because some things do, are, do take effort, but hopefully are more valuable um, to them and the students going forward. So 
Um, they do get, um, for, for example, I, I believe with our Kings Online uh, aspect, they do have time to help to create content that goes totally online. Um, but there is uh, ways uh, and, and issues with about freeing up time so they can really look at the curriculum uh, and look at, at options of how the technology can support what they want to do. Because I'm sure um, academics don't necessarily want to stand at the front and, and repeat the same lecture year after year after year and, and not have a, um, an encouraging debate with their students in, in, in the classrooms. Uh, and they much more be enriched themselves as well to have challenges and what have you. So. Um, if I, if I think I, I get, get your question, um, I don't see technology um, being anything other than something that um, hopefully academics will, will want to use to improve the student experience and their own experience at, uh, at King's. So, but you're right, and, and it's one of, on one of my slides, it's about that cultural thing. Uh, there's a cultural shift. I think um, the way we've educated hasn't really changed massively um, over 200 years. Um, in the last 10, 15, uh, 15 20 years, obviously, the, the, um, e-learning has evolved. Um, but I think we're still at that stage where, um, especially for on-campus, is we're bolting technology on um, to do that uh, enhancement, so like the lecture capture, rather than looking at potentially flipping the classroom and not having to record a lecture because the content's already provided a different way to the students and there'll be no value in recording the lecture because it's debates and, and what have you. The other piece that we're also looking at, which I didn't mention, um, was looking at about how we also uh, bring the outside into the classroom. So um, rather than having the four walls and that's it, a synchronous uh, session, it's also understanding how students might attend uh, that session from afar. Um, so then try, again, it may be just enhancing current practice, but again, we want to learn from that to see how if that is a viable option uh, and, and, and can be used uh, as a, uh, an efficient uh, and an effective delivery method going forward. Thank you, James. I, I, yes, please, madam. Uh, hi, my name is Rashida Adam, UEL alumni. Uh, my question is to Alan Dean, Burning to Learn. Um, in your experience of working with uh, young learners that have actually left uh, education prematurely, um, what have you found that um, most of the students wanted to actually learn when they came to you? What was it that, that they were interested in learning about and what was it that they were not engaging with in, in school, for example? What, was, what, what were they requesting that they wanted to learn? It varied. We used different projects, project-based learning, but it was listening to them, not prejudging them, and suddenly the barriers went down, so whether they felt that their <coughs> literacy skills were poor, they would open it. Their science skills, we would bring in specialists in different areas that would just open them up, and it was actually finding out who they are just opened it, and I think technology is there because you see some young people work in fields with computers that you think, how are they doing that? They don't, un but they do. They haven't got a fear of hitting that button. Old people like me think, will it delete? Will I never find it again? Where they jump in. So it started off, as I said, with literacy and numeracy at the special needs end. And then it was building social skills and the soft side. I think we're missing that. And as everyone, someone mentioned earlier, it's what we've got up here that needs to be tapped in. That's the greenest energy there is on the planet. And we've all got it. We've got seven billion people, but we're creating robots to talk to people and give them company. To me, we should use the technology, but we need to know where we're going. And it needs to suit a community, or a street, or a city. But you have to pull the people together. You have to recreate community and family. We go to our rooms, we sit there on the laptop, picking up the phone, looking at this, all of us. I've got some friends staying with me this week, and all they're doing is tick, 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 anything. Come back when you've got less time. 
I hope that helped. Thank you. I think I will um, take advantage of uh, my, my presence as a moderator of this um, uh, meeting. The reason we uh, invited and uh, uh, West responded so generously to our initiative was to see to what extent the e-learning uh, technologies can help uh, the United Nations system organizations in the implementation of the 2030 agenda. And I think I, I heard uh, a lot of things that uh, actually correspond to the spirit of this new agenda, which is uh, probably the most uh, comprehensive programmatic document ever adopted at, at international uh, level. Uh, what, what does uh, this uh, agenda require from us? It, it asks for participation, it asks for multi-stakeholderism, it asks for an integrative approach, which means that you know, we, we do not have to make this uh, anymore, these uh, distinctions between categories, uh, member states, private sector, academia, uh, um, uh, civil society activists, etc. We all have to contribute to, to the common goals. Then the e-learning platforms also, also, as we heard this, uh, the first part of the of the debate, they also uh, uh, do not use that distinctions. You know, uh, the the current level of education, the the technological means available, the geographical areas. So, it, it some in many respects, e-learning echoes uh, the 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 imperative of the. Uh, to, to, uh, 2030 agenda. So I, I take advantage of the presence of all panelists in the room to ask them a final reflection on how, what would you advise the United Nations system in terms of using e learning platform in support of the agenda? The, the question is addressed to all, all panelists, so it's not mandatory, but okay, uh, I, would, I would invite uh, all of them with their personal final reflections on that. Um, well, if I may start, uh, I think what uh, the United Nations has got in front of them is a, is a huge opportunity here of uh, uh, delivering a proper program of development internally that will in turn uh, cause development around the world. Um, if we, the United Nations is a huge organization and it has got people placed all around the world with lots of expertise uh, that is highly contextualized. I think if you put those people together into a training program, uh, the benefits for the organization as a whole and then for the communities in which they operate could be enormous. I think what, what you need uh, uh, to start with is a vision. Uh, you need a strategy on making that happen and you need to bring in the expertise from both the, the private sector and the public sector and all of us working together on that. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. I don't mind going next. Um, um, I think it's just um, e-learning um, provides so so many opportunities, um, and it's just making sure, as I've said, it's just used in the most appropriate ways. Um, this is a huge opportunity that uh, can be used um, um, that we see across across uh, a broad spectrum of of, op of of areas, and I think it's it's. I don't want to be seen as a bit of a, a downplaying. Um, Innovation, um, I think it's a massive, uh, a massive benefit. Uh, it's just understanding the context. I'll just be uh, wary of going forward. And that's it. That's, um, but as I've said, um, this is. I'm just playing devil's advocate. There's a huge potential here, and it's um, it's just knowing that there's um, two sides of the coin and making sure we have the answers for the ones that are less tech um, um, inclined. Thank you. Thank you, James. Yeah. Yes, please, Joanna. Um, yeah, again, not to be too negative myself, um, but what I would say is that, yeah, there, there is a, a huge amount of um, opportunity in terms of moving education online. What I will say is that the private sector does very much have its eye on that at the moment um, and is looking to, you know, as they will, profit from um, what can be done in this space. I think it's really important for um, educational institutions and both non- and intergovernmental organisations to work together to potentially to 
resist that pressure to an extent. So, you know, if we if we can all collaborate um, both in a, you know in a, in a pedagogic sense, in terms of domain knowledge, sub, subject matter expertise, that kind of thing, but also in terms of the tools and platforms that we make use of, you know. Um, uh, pushing ourselves towards things like open source platforms where we where we possibly can um, maybe we yeah we can resist that pressure um, to some degree so yeah it's really just about entering partnership with each other um, and working together thank, thank you Jana Andrew yeah okay um, really support what Jana said about not just because we call the open university but um, open source solutions both in terms of platform and content, so Creative Commons licensing, seem to be absolutely critical. There are lots of qualities to them that we need to get right, but if they're not open source and creatively Commons licensed, um, you stand no chance of adaptive local solutions. And if you don't have la adaptive local solutions, you don't get engagement. You know, the one thing that's very off-putting to a learner is that's not me, doesn't look like me, not wearing the same clothes as me, not talking the same language, not of the same religion, inappropriately dressed. All of those things can completely un undermine an educational activity. So I think open source content, open source systems on a mass scale, because if we're doing this, we're doing it because millions, billions of people have to be engaged in this process for it to be meaningful, and you can't do that on face-to-face. But any solution that excludes the social as well is going to probably fail. So encouraging a social dynamic around the learning and supporting that, the crowd can do an amazing thing. You know, the fifth most visited website in the world is Wikipedia. It is an educational resource of untold quality and capability, and it's made by the crowd. So there are some fantastic things to do. And one technical plea, please make sure you have an offline version. Not everybody lives in a city and has copper wire or Wi-Fi. A lot of people still rely on paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Please, Alan. I'd agree with the two speakers before. Perhaps we need to choose or suggest to the UN they look across five continents and they actually put one project together that the universities work with and work with a particular community and that becomes the open source and suddenly we then get the movement and then profit has to happen for us all to go along. It's the way the world works. But if profit or money is the key thing we're after, we never get there. Because your amount of the profit, instead of my amount of the profit, we become arguing and then we break up. We need to find a way that the profit for this experience at this community, that isn't a problem. It's the energy, a certain amount of cash, and watch where it goes. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we, yes, uh, yes, please, please. Hi, um, my name is Madison. I'm from the University of East London. I'm uh, going into third year, um, studying international development with NGO management. Um, I just wanted to follow up on one of the previous points on uh, adaptivity, like an adaptability, and um, what the universities and like what the UN can do to um, make some of these like open learning sites more culturally appropriate and um, more um, accessible in some of these um, in some of these other countries where like he says you know you need to have an offline version and things along that line like what can um, the UN do to make it more um, culturally appropriate I guess and accessible to some of these countries thank you very much anyone else with a question or a comment Yes, please, the young lady there, yeah. Okay. Hi, oh. uh, Marina Sorel from UEL. Uh, I have a comment um, regarding the culture um, influence of, of like um, online education and the importance of it. I, I think 
A very important element is the political discourse that affects the culture and even the, import, the emphasis on education and how it differs from time to time and from like uh, country to country. And um, I think the UN should pay attention to that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think it's a valid comment. Uh, thank you very much. Sir. Yes, Jidda uh, Gazama from the University of Maiduguri. Uh, Alan Deans, are we willing to change? This really got to my mind so much that I must speak. We are willing to change. The case of Open National Open University of Nigeria has taught a lot of us that when you consistently stay on a point of value and quality, people are going to see and change their minds. There was so much opposition to open university in Nigeria, but one person made the change. Our former president, uh, President uh, Olushogun Obasanjo, saw this as very, very, very important for us developing uh, world. He not only brought somebody far away from Australia as a vice chancellor to that university, he appointed some of us that had nothing to do with the open university and we forced ourselves to change. And today, that single person got his bachelor's, his master's, even PhD through open university. Today, Open University of Nigeria has changed the attitude of people towards e-learning. Not only that, many universities in that country now are trying to steal from National Open University of Nigeria. So we are willing to change. The university is willing to change. To even go to places like Perda to educate women. And when United Nations now begins to put open inputs into e-learning, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are going to be even more open to change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we've heard very, very wise words about the importance of knowledge as a global public good, as one of the panelists, the, uh, the first part said, and uh, knowledge is indeed uh, the, the resource that is cultivated by education, and it is a resource that actually does not decrease uh, while it is consumed. So I think uh, our debate concludes on a quite uh, a positive and optimist uh, uh, note. Uh, I'm glad to have found that uh, during these debates from different perspectives, uh, there is a lot of, uh, of uh, common understanding and common denominator uh, on the, the potential of uh, uh, e-learning. And I will definitely uh, will try to pass this message, not only to pass this message via, via our uh, review, but also to make some, some uh, 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 concrete recommendations in order to mobilize the interest of the, uh, all the United Nations organizations, uh, in particular in relation with the uh, laboratory of ideas and innovation that is uh, represented by the academic uh, community. I'd like to thank once again by applauding all the panelists for very, very interesting and informative debates uh, that we had this uh, uh, afternoon. Can we ask all other distinguished speakers to come forward? We have a small appreciation certificate to give to all the speakers. I think I have done very well. They have changed before the... says appreciation for your in recognition of your valuable presentation and constructive contribution as a valued member. I think they have done that. So they deserve a big uh, <laughs> of
Zahara. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Professor Mario? Thank you. Thank you very much. Should I have digital badge? Joanna, start. I've just downloaded your report. It's really handy, actually. It's really good to see the one that the king is packaging. Yeah, it's really handy. Thank you. Uh, I think she deserves another clap because she's the only lady in this panel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank she hasn't got the longest hair. No, that's <laughs> true. The longest hair. Okay. <laughs> Alan Bean, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one for Will Shen because. He's from Jigea, UNTN. He has been working quite hard behind closed door, contacting all these people. So we also appreciate your help here. I believe you agree. Yes, he has done a lot of work here. Absolutely. And finally, not least, uh, Dijon. Where is Dijon? I think your uh, John is a researcher for the GIU on this project. So next year we will see you telling us more about this project. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I think we can take all this as a group with uh, Dimitri himself. He has. You are the moderator. Let me just so do if one can, of you. Okay. Do one of you too. Okay. Then let's take a group one. <laughs> uh, this video, by the way, I think is going to be quite. Uh, we will put them online and we will share it with you. Okay. Yeah. It should be a normal YouTube. So. Right, what that moves. Yeah. Yeah. Please remember, if we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.